Committee all is called back to order. We will continue recess until we reach a quorum. All right, so we're, we're ready at 6. We just need a couple more to show up. Thank you. Continue recess.
Good afternoon. We're back from recess. Uh, we are on Chapter 2, Part 1, Guam Department of Education. We have uh, joining us this afternoon members of GDOE uh, to my left, and I'll have them go ahead and introduce themselves for the record. Good afternoon. My name is Francis Santos, Acting Superintendent. Good afternoon. Franklin Cooper Nurse, Acting Deputy of Finance and Administrative Services. Thank you. And just uh, for uh, some clarification, uh, both uh, members of the panel were previously sworn in uh, earlier during the session, so they are still under oath, just as a reminder. Uh, now we'll begin uh, opening up to the floor for questions. I will begin uh, in the last row, Senator St. Augustine. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, because it was bookmarked by Speaker no uh, Senator Nelson, I highly recommend we start with first so we can address the uh, issues that are on hand. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Senator St. Augustine, uh, please proceed. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my colleagues, you should have in your hand a copy of the uh, Delivered uh, Competitive Wage Act a Education Pay Plan. I think that's one of the issues that were brought up uh, in reference to DOE, is what plan do they have? Um, that, that plan was submitted to the speaker not too long ago, but it was submitted to the speaker, and uh, I hope that it will suffice. And if I'm correct, on DOE, I have... Uh, I, have, I probably have an amendment somewhere in there, but I would ask they come back to me so I can make sure I don't have an amendment for DOE and we can move on. Thank you, Senator Sanagustin. Senator Terlahi. I just wanted to uh, kind of just come out with the main problem that we faced during the, uh, the interaction, the discussion. And one of the biggest problems that we faced, or that, was, that came out from uh, my colleague is, why were the teachers paid before September? And uh, it was explained by by the director of administration and however, uh, I'm not really uh, in total uh, agreement with what was presented by the director of administration because in the absence of document, I cannot further verify if or not uh, other than the discussion between Mr. Berm and, uh, and the director of OAB regarding the payment for the teachers. But I just need the hard document to assure myself that the pay raises that, that the teachers got is uh, in compliance with, with the laws uh, to give them the pay raise. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Talahi. Senator Bloss. Mr. Senator Tidegui. Thank you. Just a quick um, notification. I've, uh, I'd like to yield my time, Mr. Chair, to uh, Senator Bloss. Okay. Duly noted. Senator Bloss. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, uh, Mr. Superintendent, Mr. Cooper-Nurse, for being here today. Um, I, I guess you know where my line of questioning will be, and just so that we can validate and okay, then this this uh, letter. Thank you very much for for it finally coming to this to, to this uh, body. Uh, what that said is, is can I can you explain to me the the genesis or how it got into your hands to get into ours? Okay, so I, I guess from a process perspective, Senator Bloss, um, 
GDOE was a partner in the formulation of the plan. It clearly states that in the, uh, the memo prepared by Mr. Byrne. Um, the conversations that obviously we've been having with GDOE and the um, governor, lieutenant governor, and the staff down there was how do we properly apply what the public law is saying with respect to submitting a plan and you know going back and forth finally you know at the call and the behest of um, uh, Senator Joseph Augustine I said you know I'm just going to submit this um, notwithstanding your line of questioning uh, that we obviously have heard and that's why you have this in front of you today it, it was just you know, we, we've gone back and forth enough, and I just said, there is a plan in place. Um, we played a part in it. GDOE, obviously, were the beneficiary of what this plan has produced. And I can only say today that I'm asking you, this body, to accept this plan and adopt it via adopting our supplemental budget request. Okay? So it's safe to assume, then, that the governor there's full knowledge that this plan is being submitted? The answer is yes. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Um, in the plan, I guess, and I'm sure that you, I know you read through, read through this. Yeah. The other day I walked into your office and this was in front of you. And um, I noticed, just so that we can clear, uh, clear this, the recommendation that was in the report is provided on page nine. It states here that the Department of Administration recommends a base salary increase to the EDU pay plan structure by 16, 16%. You see that there? At the bottom of the page. Okay. Then you go to the page 11, which is the last page of the report. Um, and there seems to be a handwritten, there's a, or there, there not seems, there is a handwritten um, note here that says basically amendment effective next pay period beginning 5-23-2022 of 20%. Um, can you explain the difference between the 16% recommended and the 20%? I, I, can, I can appreciate if, I know you're not the author of this report, nor were you probably in that room when this, when this document is being signed. I'd just like to know if you have any knowledge as to why it would, you know, what was the logic or what was the reason and other than she's the governor and she can, she can make her own decision based. Well, first of all, let's, I'm sure that every teacher and every administrator is very thankful for the extra 4%. Okay. And that, that I can assure you. Um, no. As to why she decided to round up, I absolutely, I'm, I'm gonna absolutely take the fifth on that one because, okay. you know, fortunately, um, I and don't believe Mr. Kupiners to the left of me was there either when this document was being signed or even delivered. But um, again, uh, effectively, Senator Bloss said, you know, that that's, that's an additional 4% of what the recommendation was and, okay, uh, and the reason yeah. why I bring this up, yeah. Mrs. Mrs. Santos, is, is um, there are a number of charts and tables that are included in this report, and these re I'm going to venture to say that these numbers here reflect a 16% yes. increase, not a 20. Do you have anything? Have you updated that you can provide to us that would show? No, Senator, I don't have that updated basis. What I, what I can say is in reading the memo, um, right above the 20% uh, amendment signed by the governor on mm -hmm. the first paragraph, um, again, there was a, a back and forth study and work between GDOE and DOA. 
I believe that reference to, and I, I can only read from the memo that's provided, because like, like our acting superintendent said, I wasn't there, nor do I can answer to the difference in the percentage, but in the top, there is a reference to the 20% being the market rate at the 50% comparable to the rest of the teacher pay scales. Yeah, I, I, I read that too. And, um, but, but to answer your question, no, we don't have the updated or the basis of the, the, the difference in the figures. Okay, no, but I'm sure that somewhere in the department, because you, you know, based on, you know, I don't want to get into that conversation. It's already started to get paid because of something else that you do have a chart or a list. The, of, the answer is yes, Senator. Boss. Okay. So, you know, subtracting or extracting the information that's not necessary, you know, to be able to make the analysis. Can we get a copy of that so that we can see what the, what the comparative we'll, we'll is? We'll send you the upgraded, uh, I'm sorry, the 20% pay scales. Um, Okay. Senator, for the update as we paid it, yes, we can give you the, okay. the staffing pattern with the reflective uh, percentage increases. Okay. Okay. Um, now, the second question is, is um, it's not too clear here. Um, however, wasn't there an incentive pay that was provided along this, along these lines? Uh, repeat the question. Uh, incentive, incentive pay. pay? Right. Five thousand dollar to your to other than your teachers, your teachers. There, there was a separate pay outside of the EDU, and okay. that covered employees that weren't um, the teachers and the nurses. Okay, then just to be clear, that wasn't part of this. No, no okay. that's separate. Yes. Okay. Okay, because I just wanted to be okay. Thank However. You. In your in the discussions that we had and recognizing that this was implemented on the 23rd of May, there obviously and there was a concern about being able to gap that be you know the payments right between the 23rd of May to the 30th of, of September, which caused you to have to reach back to USDOE to ask for a reprogramming. Um, Correct. Okay, so in that reprogramming, I guess, was that, how much was the, 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 the amount that you needed to re reprogram? Uh, I believe the amount was approximately $10 million. $10 million. Okay, of the 10 million. Relative to the teacher pay increase. Um, of the $10 million, how much of that was for the teacher's pay, and how much was that was, was for the, the admin pay or the staff pay? So in the $10 million, that was to include the teachers and the assistants and the admin. So that was the total cost for the differential. The, the retention pay is separate and apart from that amount. So the retention pay, was, it was separate from the 10? Correct. Yet you, in your request to USDOE, you combined it. We combined it as one request as I followed the email thread for um, a reprogramming of the budget so that we can have access to the approval for two separate things. One was the um, teacher pay differential and the second one was for a retention pay to non-teach employees. Okay. Now you, you mentioned as far as the email thread and, and full disclosure, thank you very much for uh, providing me some of that information. Uh, however, what I did not find uh, basically was a, the language or the narrative for the justification um, for the for the money necessary to be able to gap the teachers' pay with May twenty third to September thirtieth. Do you have that information? I'm very much interested to hear, I mean, to, to find out what was the narrative or what was the justification used to USDOE to ask for the reprogramming? So I believe in the email thread that was provided to you, that justification is absent, but I can further look at other emails and other supports that were directly communicated to USAID for that justification. Okay, okay. And, and Mr. Cooper Nurse and, you know, and Mr. Santos, the reason why I need that is, is basically I'm just a little concerned and wanting to make sure that 
obviously USDOE knew that this was to, to, as, to serve as a gap, but I'm sure that there was, there was the need to be able to give some assurances that if we're going to give pay raises up to September 30th, there was another funding source identified for the pay raises afterwards, or to continue the pay raises afterwards. Mr. Cooper, is you're nodding your head, or you, do you re recall any of that con type of conversation? I, I don't recall the, the conversation, but I, but I agree with the, the sentiment that you said that in order for us to get the approval, there would be a justification and rationale to ask for that. So we can, like I said, I can, we can look further and, and get that justification to get that approved. Okay. Um, so is it now, is there going to be a need to be able, to, as a result of this, to adjust any of the numbers or in as far as the budget? Have you seen what, the, what the, your proposed budget is, Mr. Santos, for GDOE? Yeah, yes, we have. So have the pay raises or the increases in the, in, in the pay been um, is it, has it already been incorporated or is it already part of that, that, that budget that's there? Yes. Okay. So it may be safe to say that you're not going to ask for an increase in, the, in your budget for, for the fiscal year to be able to do for, the, for this pay well, raise? We, we submitted a budget in January as required by law and then um, we actually started working with Senator Joe and Steve Guerrero and the staff there, and we submitted a, basically a, you know, the, the amount needed to cover the anticipated pay raise starting October 1. Okay, so there was, yeah. all right, okay. So there is, right, we there just is wanted some. to make sure that. Okay, and just for a matter of, of administrative cleanup, Mr. Coopers, just for clarity, I know I asked you this question the last time you were here, but I need to ask again. You, there was a $100,000 appropriation to conduct a study for the Competitive Wage Act that was provided in 3654, Public Law 3654. Um, am I correct in saying that you said that you used up, you, you, you only used about $75,000 of that? No, the 75000 was released by BBMR and cash received from, GOA, from, from DOA but we never expended on the 75,000, so that balance remains available. Um, again, as, as the progress in, in the internal structure that we were working with was within our HR administrator to, to work with a select group of uh, administrators um, directly with the board, the GFT had a presence, to go through the process of doing the study internally. But so the account was drawn down from BBMR DOA to GDOE. The allotment was released and the cash was received, but we haven't expended on it. Okay, but it's still, it's still in your bank. All Correct. Right. Okay. Um, Mr. Sanders, did you have anything further that you want in as far as this? Yeah. In, 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 can I get the body to give me permission to buy more air cons with the extra 100000 I thought you were going to ask me for crayons. Thank you, Senator Blas. <laughs> Okay. She was serious about the crayons. And our immediate need is air cons. <laughs> okay. Um, Mr. Santos, is, is there anything else that you wanted to add with regards to, to the submission of, of, of this pay? I, yeah, I'll be remiss. And say, yeah. Actually, there are. Um, as we all know, our GovGuam procurement system sucks. Um, I need a little bit more flexibility to make it work properly so that I don't get the daily phone calls about the air con, the plumbing, the electrical, the doors, the grass cutting. <coughs> it's just a little bit too cumbersome a process for a agency that is a $200 million budget to be worrying about 250,000 and half a million there. It's, it's you know, the, the process doesn't lend itself to efficiency. And it, it, it gets bogged down in, in a process that just, in my world, it's too antiquated. If you can get something as simple as, I get three required bids, Mr. Cooperters to the left of me certifies that the funds are available 
per the account that we're going to use it, and then it comes over from my signature to say start start this process. It's just you know every day it's it's the same word that I hear. It's stuck in procurement. It's still going to the number of signatures that we need. I can assure you, senators, that the money that is there today, I don't want U.S. Ed on me or him or any other employee at GDOE. The money we're going to spend is going to be spent properly for what we're doing today under my watch. But I really need, I'm sorry, we really need some flexibility in how we operate. And, and the procurement world that we live in just doesn't lend itself to, to quickly address how to deal with the everyday problems that we're facing at GDOE. So that, that is one area of, of great concern that, that we can try to at least, and I'm only asking for federal funds. I'm not talking about our general fund money. The bulk of the money that we're going to be using, actually all the money they're going to be using is from federal funds. I just need a little bit more latitude to be able to move faster, you know, than the snail pace that we got. Thank you. I think actually my question was geared toward, gear to, line towards the report. So but I gave you the latitude. Don't worry. You were able to do that. Okay. Um, I, I, I guess my, my question here um, is, again, we want to be able to clean this up so that there is no doubt that if this is the route that we're going to be going down, this is the route we're going to be going down. Um, what we have before us, the body, is obviously a, I don't want to say a conflict, but a dilemma in that prevailing statute says that the pay raises don't take effect until June of 2023. But obviously, it's already been started. Okay. And um, this is something that the body is going to have to deliberate down the road. And I don't think that it's in anybody's nature, recognizing that at the time that we, the, you know, the, the language was put in place, there was a, no, a number of uncertainties. There continues to be the uncertainty. Okay. However, in order to be able to deal with that. Um, and as a starting point, I truly appreciate that now this report is with, with us. Okay. Noted. So that we can, we, we can work then to make it cl clear because what we don't want are, is the employees, is the government, our students, because I've gotten, you know, this has already affected students. Um, They'd like, they'd like some clarity as to where things are at. So I assure you, Mr. Santos, that we will work toward that, okay? Thank you, Senator. Thank you very much. Mr. Chair, I would yield the rest of my time. Thank you, uh, Senator Blas. Senator, Senator Ada, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Superintendent Santos, Senator, and Frank Cooperness, thank you guys for being here. 
but most especially thank you for turning in this this uh, document right the 2022 competitive wage act educator pay plan and I think had this just been done from the very beginning you know we wouldn't find ourselves in this situation going back and forth and teachers not knowing what the, the outcome would be uh, with the submittal of this document now you know we can at least move forward and start tackling everything else in the budget we know this is here it's submitted we know it's going to be in part of the budget so we just got to continue moving on and um, supporting what we can for our, our education department and you know I, I totally agree with you senator I, I think you do need latitude in your your procurement process and at, at gdoe because uh, what it takes to to go out there and, and keep these rooms cool so these teachers can educate the students so the ed, the, the students can learn is very vital and I hope that uh, my colleagues here would be able to come up with some type of uh, plan so that we'd be able to give you that latitude and you'd be able to continue moving forward and improving our education system and uh, do what you can while, while you guys are at the helm. And like you said, you can only do what you can while you're there. And you know, anything that I can do to help you, I'm, I'm more than with you and uh, good luck and everything. That, uh, but again, most especially, thank you for the submittal of this document. Uh, we truly appreciate it. Uh, that's all I have, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Senator. You, Senator Thank you, Senator Adda. Senator Brown, you're recognized. My colleagues are being very nice. I don't think this makes the issue go away with regards to how the pay uh, increase was implemented. I think, you know, none of us are going to argue about the value of teachers. I think we've all received the benefits of an education that have allowed us the opportunity in our lives all the way to being here today. But I think the reality and the concern and what we're seeing, what bo what's a bit bothersome, I mean, it's almost like the teachers are being played in this process because, you know, decisions are unilaterally and unilaterally were made unless they were consulted behind closed doors with some members of this body. And that's just not how the process should be. I'm sure Senator Santos, in your own legislative experience, you would have known that had you been sitting on this side of the aisle, you'd be here asking these very same questions. And I think that's the concern. And maybe some of my colleagues want to gloss over that, you know, gosh, elections soon, and we want to be nice to everybody and hold hands, and, and isn't that wonderful? But that's not the reality, and that's where the concern is, is when you're talking with public funds, and these are a substantial amount of public funds. In this case, it's particularly for a Department of Education, but this could have been for anything. Uh, and here we are, after the fact, having to try and figure out how this ever got implemented without us. And you know the role of the legislature. I mean, our job is to appropriate. And right now, the governor has assumed the, power, the authority not only to of the executive, but because of these federal funds, to appropriate. And you know that the federal funds are not going to be consistent. And so the teachers received it for a very short period of time. And have they received it since then in their paycheck? Are they still receiving their, their increases? They'll get the first one. They'll get the second set tomorrow. Okay, tomorrow. but there was this gap in between. Yeah, through the summer. And, right. and, and then we also have the issue moving forward, and that's my main concern. I, I hate to make false promises, so I don't. I, it's not my, you know, people say you promise. No, not, I in particular did not promise, because I don't, I don't have a tendency to do that, and I have not in the many years that I've, I've sat in this chair. I just, you see too many of that happening and, and many people getting disappointed and disillusioned after. It's the same cycle. You know, we get excited during the election, and oh my God, once we're in office, I. Um, but I think that's the concern. It's like, how does this stuff happen without clear authorization? Or even, you know, Senator Blas had brought up, uh, nobody can even clarify which part of the law or which law actually was the basis for authorizing these pay increases. And then obligating, not the legislature, it's not coming out of our pocket, but obligating the people of Guam moving forward to quite a substantial cost that we have no idea. Nobody in here has any idea whether a year or two from now we will have the ability to continue to pay those increases on top of no doubt of the continued increases that DOE is going to have for all the other things, maybe unanticipated things now that are going to come. We've seen that. We've seen the budget of the Department of Education continue to grow and grow and grow. Granted, there are needs and you know, repairs and a whole bunch of things that need to be done. You have a major operation. But at the same time, that's no reason to not be accountable. And I think that's what's most bothersome here. It's not that you want to deny teachers pay raises, is how it came to be. And let's not kid ourselves. It is an election year. In a couple, what, in a week from now? A week from now, we're going to have a primary election. And oh, isn't it time, as I've mentioned on many days on this floor, it's being Santa Claus. 
Now we give the retirees an extra 200, they're going to vote for me. Hey, now we give the pay raise, they're going to vote for me. And at the end of the day, is the money going to be there to be consistent? And you know yourself, there's no way you can put these large amounts of dollars into the GovGuam overall budget uh, with where we are, one of the worst challenges of our economic time that we've experienced in so many years, uh, and guarantee you're going to be able to deliver. Maybe some people here don't care. They won't be sitting here. It'll be some other poor soul that thinks they're going to make a difference in this government to run and sit here, and probably, as we've in the past, have to deal with cuts. And that's the reality. What are you going to cut at DOE if you want to sustain these pay races? That's pretty tough, I'm sure, from your vantage point because of all the obligations you have. But I, I don't think we can gloss over that. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, thank you. Thank you for finally saying, oh, isn't this nice? If this had been anybody else, they'd be crucified. They would have been crucified before this legislature because we're ignoring the law. And it's just that simple little thing called the law that we're, we've ignored. And including the separations of powers and the lack of respect for that. And so that's the main concern moving forward. And I don't know, I mean, if, if, if the legislature, uh, you know, because some members here roll over for the administration, if they go ahead and do this and ignore the fact that proper steps weren't followed and don't care whether or not we have the Billy Saints, because you know there's no way, there's no way that we're going to continue this cash infusion from the federal government. And there's no way, even with the military buildup, that we knew, gosh, a couple of years before our administration ended, uh, another 10 years of military buildup, but we know also it's going, to, it's going to decrease. And we still don't have the ability to get to where we were with our tourism industry while we still you know, see tourists back to even get us to where we were a couple of years ago. So I think that's the real reality. And the one thing I don't like to do is to lie to people. That's bothersome and gloss it over right now because it's an election and then the election happens and it doesn't matter if we get reelected, who cares? Because we got elected, that was the main thing. And then our people are left short. It's either the teacher's going to be left short, or the nurses are going to be left short, or the law enforcement that still needs more resources is going to be left short. And most definitely, it's going to be our community at the end of the day who isn't going to be able to pay for all of this. And I think had we gone through the proper process, had we properly deliberated this, maybe we would have, cut it. We would have said, OK, we can determine the certain percentage is viable, and let's put this in place. And a year or two from now, we come back. We see additional revenue that, that has some consistency in it, then we can address that. But that's not what happened here. It was a unilateral decision. Now we're coming back after the fact, you know, with the broom and the dustpan, and let's just clean the mess up and let's just move on and it's okay. And I just think that's not right. And I think we need to recognize that, that a lot of the, the things that happened leading up to this just were not right. And it's that abuse of power that's concerning. I know you just, you know, I don't know, what is it, your third week, fourth week now? I mean, I know it's relatively short, um, you know, and you end up inheriting all these issues and actions that you yourself personally did not contribute to or were involved in. But, you know, unfortunately, you know, we take on the responsibilities when we assume these positions. Uh, but, but I think there's a lot more that needs to be looked at than simply saying, oh, we'll submit it. And if, if the colleagues here choose, you know, to turn a blind eye, as I've seen them in the last year and a half do, uh, you know, everything comes home to roost at some point. It's going to come sooner than later. And I'll be there to say, see, I told you so. And we know that, Francis Santos. We've been down this road before. And I just hate to continue to lie to our people and take advantage of this circumstance because we want to be beloved. So hopefully people will vote for us. And yet at the end of the day, they're the ones that are going to suffer more at the other end of this situation. DOE is going to suffer more. And our public, more importantly, is going to suffer more when all this stuff, when all the dust settles. And we have not taken on the responsibility to be real leaders, to do the real work and make sure we have some consistency in our ability to deliver the funding for the services that our people need. And that's what's problematic to me about this. And everyone, oh, you don't support that, you don't support, you don't... I think we need to sometimes just do the right thing and be truthful about it, even if it's painful. Uh, and sometimes make the responsible decision, not the popular. Popularity comes and goes. It, it fades. It fades with the age and time. But making responsible decisions so that we can be consistent in providing funding to DOE, because I don't know. I don't know how we're going to keep this ship floating. I really don't know how we're going to do it. And my election, I don't think anybody's election here is even equitable to be even worthy of mattering with regards to the bigger picture. So I simply want to relay that because to me, in this whole process, that's what's most troubling. 
and I hope we, we get some clarity and address it, but I'll tell you, I, you know, will the right people do the right thing? I don't know. Some people do what's expedient and politically beneficial for the moment, and then where are we down the road? We're no better. So with that, Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to comment. Thank you, Senator Brown. Vice Speaker. M Mr. Chair, uh, if I may, I do have a proposed amendment as it relates to the uh, um, DOE's libraries, but I'm working the logistics out with my staff, and I know I was waiting for an answer from DOE. So if I could yield my time and come back to me before, for that amendment, um, it was there was a request, but uh, um, I'm waiting for the answer from DOE. I, uh, the libraries, I'm sorry, working closely with them. So if you can yield it for me to come back to it. Thanks, Vice Speaker. Just to be clear, um, per our rules, only amendments that were submitted prior to the opening of the chapter will be accepted at this time. So we can only stick with amendments that were submitted uh, prior to the opening of this specific chapter. Senate, uh, is there something you would like to add at this time? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just think that uh, as soon as I get the answer, to, I'd ask for a reconsideration and some courtesies on this matter. It's important. And I, I, I just want to make sure that it doesn't impede on the budget of the, um, the Department of Education working closely with the Guam Public Libraries. And that was a request that came my way as oversight chair of the libraries. I'm just waiting for the official answers from the, uh, the administrators from that, de from that area. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Speaker. Senator Shelton. Senator Perez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I'm listening intently with the uh, discussion thus far, and um, I do have also concerns about the procedural part, but I, and have, being a, a teacher to myself, uh, I know this is uh, greatly needed and much, um, it's long overdue. Because um, I know as professionals, it'd be, you know, it's important that our professional, pro professionals are, are compensated properly so that um, you know, they can survive in that one job. I know many teachers that need multiple jobs to survive, and it's really important to, to help uplift our, our working class, who's often overlooked. Um, I just have a question, too, because when I was a teacher, I know when they had the Competitive Wage Act then, uh, there seemed to be more of a, a preference for the incoming teachers versus the, the more experienced teachers, and with this one, it's a, across the board 16%. Um, was there any deliberations, deliberations on that? Senator, I'm sorry, can you go ahead and repeat that question? Yes, yeah, so I recall when they, the la when they last raised the teacher's pay, um, they did it differently. So they actually uh, gave more preference to the new teachers versus the, uh, the more senior teachers. And uh, with this one, it's a 16% across the board. So if you can uh, probably perhaps, was there any deliberations to your knowledge on how they came to that? I, I wasn't involved in those discussions. Again, I, I think our HR administrator took the lead in working directly with our with DOA in, in that manner. I can only assume that they examined that thoroughly. Uh, again, I, I don't have insight into how they came up with those those figures. Okay, and also in regards to the differential. So there is a swing shift and night shift differential. Do we have an estimate of the cost of that, potential cost of differential? See again? I'm sorry. Did you get a chance to read the submission here? Yes, I did. Which one, which one are you referring to? I'm sorry, I was distracted. Okay, so if you look in the second to the last page, or maybe it's the page two, it's from the Department of Administration. It's memorandum 22-0341, uh, dated June 28th, 2022. So if you look on page two, they, it talks about differential pay.
Yeah, and what's the specific question? I, again, go ahead, please. Yes, yeah, so the question was, um, is there an estimated cost of differential pay for the coming year? It, for at least as we, um, a DOE, as we implemented it, we followed the recommendations of the pay differential. So what was ever in the original memo, I believe the reference was 20, uh, I can go back to that. 20 for the administrators, uh, additional, let me get the exact figures. It was is 2010 and 15, correct. So that was the implementation that we've carried in the payments through September 30. Um, moving forward, there hasn't been a discussion other than what's presented in the plan in terms of GDOE moving forward with those payments past September 30. Uh, what's been presented is, is the plan by our acting superintendent to this body, and that is the plan of action from DOA. That again, we'll work with them to implement that uh, if it's appropriately approved by this body. So, and historically, um, when does this differential pay come into play? In, in my particular case, from a finance perspective, we, we funded the differential pay at the percentage listed. I don't know when that would come into play other than when we've, at, we've been asked to apply this from a funding perspective. So, historically, how much have we paid differential pay? Historically, from DOE? I'm not, at least in my time with DOE, I'm not aware of the, the differential pay being applied to teachers in the past. Okay, so there, to your knowledge, there wasn't any differential pay? At the time, in the time I've been at DOE, I don't believe there was any differential pay applied. Okay, so how many years have you been working at DOE? Uh, so approximately eight years as an auditor and one year as the acting deputy. So in the past eight years, there wasn't any differential pay? I, I believe the last time there was a pay adjustment was the CW. I don't believe there was anything that I, in my time that we applied differential pay to teachers. Okay, so to your knowledge, there wasn't any differential pay to teachers or administrators? Yes. Okay, even during, the, even during the uh, typhoons or the storms when we had to... Um, oh, that's house? different. When we go into the storms, we, um, it's, it's, it's a separate source of funding through FEMA that we get reimbursed. So there's a homeland security detail that we perform and we have um, our administrators open up shelters. So is there a payment made to our administrators and for our staff that are doing that duty? The answer is yes. Uh, that funding doesn't come from um, GDOE's appropriations. That comes from a separate source. And that's not a differential pay application to the administrators. They're paid on their shifts that they're worked. Uh, if they happen to work overtime, then they get the overtime pay as well. Yeah, because uh, it'd be good to know for the body to know, um, you know, as we're going to uh, going through this budget, to really kind of know what the ex expenditures are. So if you can provide that information, you know, when is differential pay kick in, and is there a projected cost? Okay. For the okay. Year? Absolutely. Yeah, I I, I I misunderstood the question. Yeah. So from the pay differential, the application was the percentage apply on differential pay for any of our employees that kicks in when they actually work night differential of those different type of special pay salaries, but we can get you that information. We'll take a moment's recess. Uh, we're having technical difficulties with the microphones.
Redwick. Okay, we are back from recess. It, I believe we've resolved the technical issues with the microphones. Senator Perez. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. So this question is for OFB. Uh, you're not, anybody here representing OFB? State your question. Uh, yeah, so the question was, um, was a differential pay contemplated with a pay increase with this current budget projection? We'll ask uh, the chair of OFB to respond because we don't have any OFB members that are sworn in on the panel at this time. Go ahead. Uh, no, uh, OFB, please. Yeah, so I know we have... Uh, the chair here as maybe perhaps one okay. of the staff. We're going to have to recess until we get someone from OFB here. There's no one uh, representing OFB on the panel that is sworn in to dis uh, answer those questions at this time. Okay. Okay, we're back from recess. Senator Perez. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, I guess I could direct the question to DOE. Please proceed. Uh, uh, could you restate the question one more time for DOE, please? 
All right, so yeah, so I just spoke with the uh, chair of appropriations and he, he basically informed me that DOE had the breakdown of the cost uh, regards to pay raises in addition to differential pay. So if, uh, maybe, at, maybe not at this time, but at a later time you can provide the body with a breakdown of the, those costs? Will we'll do, Senator. Okay, Harris. thank you. Okay, because we have it. So uh, the other question I have is regards to procurement. Of course, I could uh, ignore that comment earlier. Uh, and so the, the question I have is um, how much staff on DOE is received the, the training for procurement, all four modules? Is there a number of staff the, that received okay, that? Okay, I'm trying to refresh my memory on this one. I believe that, that the staff is required to take the procurement modules as offered based on your level within the procurement side, buyer one, buyer two and so forth. So it, it, again, as you rise up the ranks, they ask you to take the additional modules. I, I believe there's two maybe within the entire organization that have passed the entire four modules. So two only? That, I, that I am aware of. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Uh, is there an effort within DOE to increase the number of trained personnel? No, absolutely. Okay. And what is but, the plan for the coming year? The plan will be we'll encourage them as much as they can, but given the number of procurements that we currently experience it, I find it, the answer is yes, Senator. We obviously want a better trained staff. I'll be the first to admit that. Mm -hmm. But I, I, again, sitting down with them and, and understanding the, the scope of work and the amount of work involved, uh, that's gonna be a difficult task as we speak. Correct. But I, believe, I, I understand that the need to be properly trained, especially in the modules that are created to, to give them the proper guidance. I, th that's possible and they have the time. We will encourage them to go do it. Okay, in regards to, um, so my understanding is you have a memorandum of agreement with GPA to assist with the capital improvement uh, procurement. Is that correct? The answer is correct and we're still trying to uh, modify the current MOU that we have and again you said the proper word that CIP projects okay and so does that include air conditions as well the answer is yes okay and when I know that the last procurement was held up is there any um, updates on that has the procurement for the the air conditioning procurement slash contract has been completed it is now at the Attorney General's office okay so yes, your earlier reference was um, procurement, is it that over 500,000 or under 5,000? Under 500,000. And again, keep in mind that it's, it's strictly for the federal funds that we've received. And more importantly, this will all sunset on, um, I guess, December 31st, 2023, or 2024. So we have just about two years to spend all this money. Okay. So even more important to have more staff that has the training to help assist with the procurement? I, absolutely. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so, you know, again, I think, you know, oftentimes procurement gets blamed for uh, the holdups, but I think a lot of it, too, is, is you know, the amount of uh, trained pro professionals that are able to do this because it's, um, yeah, it's a very technical uh, piece of work, but I think once you're trained, um, you can accomplish it. It's just a matter of getting the, the right capacity. So yes, I, I do want to work with you in regards to looking for ways, uh, yes. but I also want to encourage DOE to, to build their capacity for procurement professionals. We agree. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Perez. Senator Moylan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for the acting director. I appreciate the report you provided, very informative. It obviously it, um, answered uh, several questions that were of concern. Uh, so I really don't have any questions other than I'm just thinking of the last statement regarding the procurement situation. We, you know, it's the federal money, but if you know somebody with uh, emergency powers that can get things expedited, maybe we can work on uh, some situation there. Even that is convoluted, Senator. All right. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. No further questions. Thank you, Senator Moylan. Senator Torres. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to thank you, um, Acting Superintendent, for this memo. It, it certainly um, is informative and, you know, we understand that what, what you had, um, what DOE had done with paying the um, teacher raises really was all a part of using federal funds and getting, um, as you said, permission from the federal entities to pay that out. So that, that, that is, you know, that is that scenario. And uh, I look forward to this body helping to ensure that the teachers get their pay and continue to get their pay in, the fiscal, in this upcoming fiscal year. Um, I don't have any further questions but I, I, or comments other than to congratulate you for taking the, the helm as acting superintendent and you know, wishing DOE much success in this upcoming school year, including with their selection of leadership. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Torres. Senator Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just, I just have one question for you, uh, Acting Superintendent. GDOE requested in the budget hearing the amount of $268 million for continuing operations. Correct. And um, what they needed with the understanding that they would utilize federal funds um, to address the CIP projects. And so that goes into the feedback. So some of the projects would include the, um, the awnings at their schools so the children don't get wet during the rain, uh, improving the gyms, addressing the air conditioning chiller units um, at the different schools, um, primary maintenance, renovations in the bathrooms. That's part of the CIP that DOE was looking at. Yes. Just to, um, with the over $200 million in federal funds they received. And so now we're looking at the Guam Department of Education budget and the number that they are given. Um, in addition, with the $268 million, we did not receive any resolution from the board about the teacher's pay um, for us to be able to adjust that. Um, because you see, the day before the competitive, competitive wage act study came in, then we had the public hearing on the budget for Guam Department of Education. And so they did not come with us, come to us with an updated number for the increase in the competitive wage act for our teachers. So I just want to ensure that the budget before you today, the budget that is given to you today, this is the budget that GDOE is now asking for and will be okay with the budget, which also includes the competitive wage act appropriation for our teachers. I want to make sure that that's accurate. And the reason why I'm asking this question is because I understand that GDOE had several meetings with OFB discussing this number and giving them the assurances, giving OFB the assurances that this money, this amount was, um, satisfies GDOE's request. So Senator, the, the original budget request, um, again, that was back in January, came in at about an ask of about 268 million at that time, um, we included everything that we need from a baseline operations. What we didn't include was the teacher pay differential. So as we worked through the process, one of the things that we're considering, understanding um, Bill 27636, provides for an, uh, an estimated amount that appears to cover the, the differential pay, but there's still, I, I, right now the estimated amount is at $232 million. Uh, based on our original request at 268, obviously that's going to become short in some areas. But one of the things that working with our acting superintendent, uh, acting superintendent Francis Sanchez is there is the possibility for us to go back again and ask for, like we did in years past, ask for uh, permission to use federal funds to cover our utilities to get us through the next fiscal year. So that given the budget of 233 million, we're able to implement if, if, it's necessary, if, if it's approved, the differential pay plus cover the baseline operations for the department. 
Yes, that's what I just said. Yes. I said that the competitive wage act study was put into place and then the next day you came into the hearing without appropriating that additional 24 million for our teachers in the next school year, which is now this school year. And so I'm going to ask you again <laughs> because I've been given assurances from our OFB that this was enough and suffices for Guam Department of Education this current budget now, which is about $37 million less than what you requested on top of the $24 million, that's about $62, $63 million less if I was to add it up. And so does this budget suffice for GDOE, granted that you will go and address the utilities costs with mm -hmm. federal funding, et cetera, however you do it? Right. So in, in is this the, a simple yes or no? Uh, yes. <laughs> the, the answer is yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. That's all the I want to know. Yes. Thank you. I am glad, Mr. Chair, that the acting superintendent has confirmed that this amount that has been budgeted is suffices to GDOE's request, even though it is about $60 million short. Because what I don't want to see is um, them going on the record next week saying that the legislature did not properly fund GDOE. And so now that we have this assurances that it is enough and it is sufficient and proper from the acting superintendent, okay, so it's, it's good to know. And Senator, my name is Francis. It's not acting superintendent. That's a misnomer title. But understand something. There, there, there's a lot no, of... No, it's very important it to, 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 to mention to that you. your position because you oversee GDOE and you are the... State Active head. Superintendent. Okay. Yeah, I get, so just, I get it. So I, that's all I needed, Mr. Santos. You I don't wanna, need to there, add there is anything something else. That, Senator, that needs to be clarified, right? When, when we look at a budget, because I've been here, right? It, it's, and especially uh, holding the position of, of Senator Snogstein, obviously this is the largest department, okay? So, and we all preach that we love education, but I, like him, recognize the needs. Okay, we're not the only department in this government. Um, what we discussed with, with Senator St. Augustine and, and uh, Steve and the team was balance this. And I said, okay, I, I mean, we get that part. And I said, but we need to recognize that the federal funds that we have, we got permission to do the utilities, we got permission to do the differential pay of 10 million. Keep in mind that every time we do that, you take away from the awnings, the canopies, the HVAC, the air cons, because it's basically moving from one pie over to the next one. And we have that luxury now because we have money. Okay? We also have the luxury of making executive decisions on how to, how to do that. But I can sit here and tell you when I sat in that chair that we have to balance the entire budget of this government. It's not just, I mean, I'm going to wear the hat as superintendent. I can sit here and say, hey, you know, we got the most votes. We got the largest employer. We can do this, but that, that's not our role here. My role here as a, a leader in a community that includes now education, I also got to say that we need to share the wealth. Okay, and right now there's perceived wealth in this government. But I recognize that a decision was made to fund pay raises. Okay, so we're now deliberating it. I, I think we've, we're going to come to the conclusion that we're going to do it. But any administrator will tell you in any one of the agencies, once we get our budgets that's approved by the legislature, we go back. We go back and we regroup and say, okay, we got one October and we got to spend it properly. So. Yes, we can live with what we're going to get because we have to. In an ideal world, hey, give us 268 and then the extra 25 million. But that's not fair. I, I'm not going to sit here and tell you guys that that is just not right. In good conscience, I can't do that. I'd rather be, be going out there and saying, GD, we made its contribution. But I'm, I'm going to be more thankful that you took care of the teachers, you took care of the administrators. Because every given day on every phone call that I get, it is always about the children. Where's my one-to-one -one aide to take care of that kid? How come the aircon's not working in that room? That's the daily calls to my office. I would rather be saying, you know what? 
I'm, I'm going to start talking about fixing another, uh, our counselors who desperately want to be recognized. I can't even find time for that kind of stuff. And in my world, that's a little bit more important at this point than, than getting the daily phone calls. I, you know, I got to say, do we have an aircon plan? We do. I'll be saying, you know, come on, we're, we're not that bad at DDOE, but the, the aircon plan that we have can't repair 3,000 aircons at one time. There's no, there's no company in Guam that's going to do that. Okay, I yeah. think you're digressing yeah, from I, the I'm, real I'm, I'm issue just, just, here. We can I, have a roundtable hearing for you to vent out your, you know, for you to vent whatever challenges you're having as a superintendent. Okay, very good. Okay, very good. I just want to make sure that GDOE is adequately funded. That's all. And Senator, then we can have a roundtable hearing addressing everything else that you've been experiencing so you can vent. No, I just wanted to, to add that, and, and I'm very grateful, and, and as Francis indicated, the amount of money we've always been diligent about once we receive it, going back with our team and making sure we're ready to operate, right, and, and run our operations. But I do want to caution that even in last year, as we presented to this body, there was a $45 million deficit that we went to federal leverage. Again, as we go through this number, and you, your math was actually right, it was a $268 million original budget request ask. It's a $37 million difference from what this bill presents. That amount, and, and to, to you know, follow Senator Joanne's comments, is these are going to be leveraged through federal funds. That's a limited time basis. Our ARP will come with an obligation date, I mean, uh, expiration date. And upon that switchover, when we don't have that, we're going to have to continue to come back down here and, and explain to the body that this is the new expenditure baseline budget that we're going to need. And there isn't going to be a, an ability for us to federally leverage some of our expenditures. So yes, to answer your question, the answer is yes. I'm glad he's very optimistic and confident that we'll get through that process. I just want to make sure that it comes with the, okay, yes, thank you. Yes, it's com it comes with the understanding that next fiscal year, we're really going to have to address a hard issue because ARP funds is being utilized and we won't have that. Understood. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, that, uh, that uh, completes our round of questions. I'm going to go ahead and... Uh, I'm sorry, one moment, we'll take a moment's recess. Okay, uh, we are excusing the panel at this time and uh, we've completed the rounds of questions. Now we will move on to amendments. Uh, we will take a short recess again while we ensure that we have the correct amendments in front of us. Okay, we are back from recess. There is only one amendment in this chapter. 
Senator St. Augustine, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's a very simple amendment. It's found on SB uh, 276 JSA, line 20, page 12, Committee of the Whole. Um, you will find that the amendment um, is to properly correct the funding source for the purpose of purchasing or developing the, the producing and producing textbooks and instruction materials related to specific content areas. The funding source used to purchase or develop textbook utilizes the next fiscal year revenues. Everything's always bought and planned a year out. And, and it changed on, on, page, on page 12, striking uh, 23 to reflect 24 um, on line 20, and then revenues for fiscal year 23. It just strikes the numbers and makes it the way it needs to be made. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, again on that amendment, uh, this amendment is to line 20, page 12 on the St. Augustine Amendment. Any comments on the St. Augustine Amendment? If not, uh, Senator Perez. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a point of inquiry. Um, this is, uh, if you can explain why we are already appropriating from fiscal year 2024 uh, to the author. Does the author yield to the question? Yes, you have to, you have to prepare in 23 in their budget to purchase for 24. It's always you're planning it out one year out. That's how it's always been. This is just a, it's almost like a technical correction to get it right. Senator Perez. Okay, just a clarification. We've, this is consistently done that we appropriate from uh, future general funds to fund current fiscal year? Because what I'm reading here is that uh, we're appropriating general fund from 2024. No, but, no, but why 24? Why Sorry, 24? can I get a quick recess? <laughs> sure, we'll take a short recess. We're back from recess. Senator Perez, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you for the recess. Uh, my answer, my question was answered. Thank you. Anyone else in the St. Augustine Amendment? If not, Senator St. Augustine, you may close. If there's no need to close, then are there any objections to the amendment? Seeing and hearing none, motion carries. That will complete uh, the education section of chapter two, excuse me, the GDOE section of chapter two. And uh, now we will go to the, one moment. Uh, where we la there was a bookmark on part two, Guam Academy Charter Schools Council. Okay, if there's no need to uh, proceed with that bookmark, we can Go now to the part three, University of Guam. We'll take a moment's recess.
Okay, we are back from recess. Uh, I just had to confirm whether or not uh, uh, senators who requested bookmarks still wanted to proceed with the bookmarks. Um, there is no need to proceed with the bookmarks at this point in time. So, uh, and because there are no other um, amendments in this chapter, this chapter, chapter two, is now closed. Next, we will go to chapter three. I will take a short recess while we make sure we have all the amendments for chapter three.
We are back from recess. Uh, we've got uh, all of the amendments in Chapter 3 of Health. Should have been passed out and disseminated to everyone on hard copy. Again, it's also on the drive. The first amendment in the queue is SB 276 TMT L24, excuse me, L4 through 24 P36. So again, this is an amendment uh, by Senator uh, Speaker Therese Terlahi to line four through 24 of page 36. Speaker Terlahi, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So this is an amendment to the Department of Public Health and Social Services um, appropriation. Their overall appropriation is the first thing we're going to affect. Um, All right, so what we are doing is increasing the Department of Public Health and uh, Social Services budget to include an increase to the H, um, Health Professional Licensing Office budget. And it's just a, a nominal increase, but it's, it would bring the Health Professional Licensing Office up to its request for FY23. So BBMR, and this is to talk about the funding source now. So BBMR confirmed during the Committee of the Whole that according to Public Law 36106, which is the GPA Energy Credit Program, 2% of the general fund reserve in the FY22 Budget Act, Public Law 3654, which is 13570574 was deposited into the Rainy Day Fund. They also confirmed that an additional 15 million was also deposited in the rainy day fund pursuant to the GPA public law. So 13 million and 15 million. Our current sub substitute bill that we are working on is proposing to also deposit an additional 14 million, 14.5 million into the rainy day fund during fiscal year 2023. So we will have an unprecedented 43 0.126 million in our rainy day fund. So I'm proposing to use a small portion of the 13.5 reserved for FY22 to increase the appropriation to the Department of Public Health, the Health Professional Licensing Office by 283,541. So that, again, it matches what they requested. Their request was a total of 584,516. The substitute bill only appropriates 300,975 for the HPLO revolving fund. That's 48.5% less than their requested amount. So the various health boards are funded um, pretty much through their licensing fees. And um, so each of the boards then, you know, puts into the pot some money to cover the administrator, uh, administrative positions at HPLO when they want to hire lawyers, for example, for um, they hired um, hearings officers, they hired like prosecutor type lawyers also to handle complaints that comes from each of those boards licensing fees in the revolving fund. They, they want to c continue with uh, the work of investigating complaints and they're looking to keep some consistent staff there at the HPLO and uh, also looking at hire in, hiring investigators. Now not all of the boards have updated their fees. In fact, most of the boards have not updated their fees in years. And so we've been pushing them to do that. I think they're all working on it. And for example, the social work board is, is uh, supposedly going to be ready soon, but we have not received it. Same thing with the, I think, the nursing board for the fees. And um, so in the interim, while the fees have not been increased, we're proposing that we just increase the HPLO budget by the 200000 that we're proposing, 283000 so that they can keep consistent and not lose any staff in the interim and that they continue to process complaints as fast as they can. Of course, these are the same boards and the HPLO office that does um, licensing, testing, 
um, you know, review of licenses and, and the complaints themselves. So that's the amendment, that's the first amendment. It would be uh, to increase the overall appropriation of the Department of Public Health using the 2% reserve that was set aside during pub, uh, fiscal year 2022. Thank you, uh, Speaker Talahi. On the amendment, Senator St. Augustine. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to first start out with, number one, I'm in support of, of the increase. Let's start with that. So there's no doubt to the people of Guam that I am in support of it. But the placement, number one, we talked about in all the chapters that are upcoming, when you start making adjustment, it appears that you're adjusting what was already passed on chapter one, your revenue base. If the paragraph were worded differently, just move down the paragraph and make it be another paragraph, then it just flows. That it's not about 61 becoming, 61216 becomes 61499. That's all I'm, I'm, I'm questioning, the placement. Because whenever you're making any increase, not part of chapter one, this normally is put in the miscellaneous provisions. So you can allow all your increases and it doesn't mix with what the revenue base is from chapter one. That's my only objection to this. Otherwise, I'm in full support of providing the funding they need. There's no doubt they need the funding. But the placement is where I'm, I question uh, and I, I, as much as I don't object, it's the placement is not right. And I just ask that maybe if the author can take a look at it and all my colleagues can take a look at any other amendments you have for, for me. Please take a look at it and let's put it in the proper place because I think legal will probably look at it that, and she understands where I'm coming from. Chapter one is your revenue base. We passed that, we're gone. Anything in all the chapters, if you wanna add money from another source outside of FY23, you can add it. But the proper place would be in the miscellaneous provisions. And that is open for that. But if the body choose to add it then, God bless DOA when they start to figure out where's the money coming from and how it's mixed up in, in the revenue base of chapter one. Because that's what it's reflecting here. The six, at the, on the second page it says 61216116 is scratched out to say 61499657. That's all I'm object, objecting to. Funding wise, full support. Take the 2%, put it and give it to public health. Put it to all the other agencies that are listed in the amendments. But put it in the proper place. I'm in full support of it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator St. Augustine. On the amendment, Senator Tidegui. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm looking at a, a, a two-page amendment uh, with the second part. Um, it's, it's sounding like from the previous speaker that this money is coming from FY. 23, but I'm reading this as it's coming from the um, FY22 budget, so I'm not quite sure. Point of order, Mr. Chair. Yeah, it's, it's from 20, it's FY22. That's why it says chapter public law 36-54, not mm. FY23. So if, if we can't take that recess, because I'm just as A point of order, Mr. Chair. Point of order. Uh, Madam Speaker, you're recognized on a point yeah, of order. Yeah, if I could just point out. So the first page, okay, there's kind of a two-part amendment, right? Mm -hmm. But we got to do one by one. Mm -hmm. The first page is changing the overall appropriation to show several sources. And one, yes, is the source that I'm pointing out, the rainy day fund, right? And the second part of the amendment, they go together, is going to allocate that appropriation made in section one, is going to allocate it to the HPLO office, right? And this is how it's done throughout the bill. They make the overall appropriation for the department, and then they allocate from that appropriation to various projects within, within that agency. So I am not, by this amendment, at all affecting any revenues. I'm taking money from a special fund and putting it into the HPLO office. 
The money's there. I'm not affecting any predictions of how much money is there. The money's there. And just like we take money from any special fund and appropriate it, I mean, that's exactly, this is exactly where it goes. It goes in the appropriation part of the bill. We're not in the revenue section anymore. We're in the appropriation section. And that's why I'm appropriating from this fund that BBMR confirmed to have a balance. And we're just appropriating that and then allocating that appropriation. That appropriation to public health is going to be allocated to the HPLO office. Just like it's done throughout the bill. Just like appropriations are allocated throughout the bill. And if you read the special fund, it's described as the 2% general fund reserve in section, and that's the title it's given in Public Law 3654, the 2% general fund reserve in section 2I of chapter 1, Public Law 3654. And then I put rain, parentheses rainy day fund because that's exactly how it's listed in Public Law 3654. So that's the fund. And so hopefully that clarifies. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Senator Tidegui. Um, so that I don't lose my, I know it was a point of order and I had some questions asked for I short. I think uh, technically yeah, it was you. a point of information, and yeah. Yeah, and I'll still like to save my place if we can take a short recess so I can continue we'll go on. We'll take a short to recess. To make sure because um, Mr. Chair, before we take that short recess, though, I, I just want to make it clear that in Public Law 36, Public Law 3654, which is the FY22 budget, mm -hmm. we passed a, a, a bill, the GPA bill, that amended the FY22 budget, amended it. But when we did, I mean, nobody realized that there was 13 million plus floating because the intent was to put 15 million in the rainy day fund. And it wasn't until last week when my colleagues found out I, that there was actually inadvertently 13 more million put into a rainy day fund, but it was not really put into the rainy day fund because if you looked on page eight, of that bill, of the GPA bill, it clearly says that it's still suspended, that the 2% of the general fund revenues into the rainy day pursuant to 22436 Chapter 22, Title V, Guam Code Annotated, is suspended for fiscal year 22. So there is no authorization or appropriation to put that money into the rainy day fund. That money is floating because there's no authorization. Now we heard from BBMR that, oh, they put that 13, they assume, and they just put that 13 million into the rainy day fund, but there was no authorization. So that's, I just wanted to clarify that. So this appropriation is not increasing the revenues. It's money that is out there that nobody has been using and doesn't have authority to use at this point. So I just wanted to make that clear before we go into find out what further into the uh, question of this amendment, okay? Okay, thank you, Senator Tidig. We, we will now take a short recess. If I could, Mr. Okay, we're back from recess. Madam Speaker, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to... Um, move to withdraw this first amendment this uh, where it shows the overall changes in the public health budget just withdraw that all together there is a motion to withdraw on that motion are there any objections seeing none motion carries thank you mr. chair if I may proceed yes madam speaker you so may with proceed. my second amendment it's it's the HPLO amendment so this is line 10, page 40, TMT, L10, P40. These are all put up line at 2.43 p.m. Okay, so this one shows that for the HPLO office, this, the bill already gives 300975 from...
from the appropriation in section one of this chapter. So what I'm adding is the underlined sentence at the end of the paragraph that says, notwithstanding any provision of law, 283,541 shall also be appropriated from the 2% general fund reserve in section 2I of chapter one, public law 3654, rainy day fund to the health professional licensing office. So I hope that's crystal clear. So now I am appropriating this amount from directly from that rainy day fund to the HPLO office. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Speaker Talahi. On the amendment, Senator Sanagasin, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm in full support of this amendment. It's, it's in order now, and it's more clear. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Sanagasin. Anyone on the amendment? Senator Bloss, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, for clarity, I'd like to make an amendment to this amendment and in the area where it says notwithstanding any provision of law, when you look at this, it seems, I know it's under section 11, but then this looks like a subsection of section 11, just so that it can be subsectioned. Sorry, Senator Bloss, could you repeat that? This appears, this, this amendment, um, and I'm referring to it, where it starts with notwithstanding any provision of law, the amount of 283,000. I understand why it's in section 11, but it should be a subsection of section 11. <clears throat> I, okay. I have no objection. To, to adding a B, it? if we start notwithstanding with a B, actually, and let legal. Amend. Let me uh, take a moment to recess to confer with legal and the clerk. Yeah. Okay, we're back. Um, uh, after speaking with the clerks and uh, legal, I believe that uh, they can uh, make the technical amendment as long as there is a motion. So moved. There's a motion to uh, make a technical amendment to this uh, amendment. Any objections to that motion? Seeing none, motion carries. Anyone else on the amendment? No one else on the amendment? Madam Speaker, you may close. Thank you, Mr. Chair. No need to close. On the amendment, are there any objections? Seeing none, motion carries. Thank you, colleagues. We are now on SB 276L3P41, line 3, page 41, proffered by Speaker Terlahi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So this amendment is to add a new section 16 to this, this chapter. It's uh, Med MIP and Medicaid unexpended funds. It's to authorize a carryover of unexpended appropriations to the Department of Public Health and Social Services for MIP and Medicaid in fiscal year 2023 to be expended in fiscal year 2023. So according to uh, Chief Tess Archangel, the FMAP, which is currently 83% to 17%, that's the federal matching, so our match right now is only 17%, is good until December 13th. On December 14th, there's a possibility that the FMAP will revert back to 55, 45%. And while they are, you know, working to continue that FMAP up at its a, um, congressional level, uh, 
there is no assurance at this point that that will not change on December. So according to Ms. Archangel, should the FMAP revert back to 55%, the current appropriations to MIP and Medicaid will not be enough. There will be a shortfall, and based on the projected expenditures, public health will need about 19 million more if the FMAP reverts. And if they don't get the 19 million more and the FMAP reverts, they will not be able to access fully the Medicaid funds available to Guam. That means we will not be able to cover as many patients on Guam with Medicaid. If there's, according to Ms. Archangel, if there is a carryover of FY22 lapsed funding, uh, this will bring down the potential shortfall and uh, by about $7 million. That's from carryover FY22 lapsed funds. And so this amendment will allow them to carry over prior fiscal year funds, appropriations. And another reason why I want them to be able to carry over is because a lot of times the claims that they wait for on Medicaid claims come in like now at the very end of the fiscal year. And so they're still processing one fiscal year while we're moving into the next. And so if that fund, those funds remain available to them you know, that just helps them to cover those prior fiscal year claims and, and use the FY23 monies for, for new FY23 claims. Um, of course, the most important part is that the more we can put towards Medicaid, the more coverage we can get. And in the event that we are lucky and the FMAP doesn't revert, back to 5545 and that they end up with a little bit of extra after all claims are paid, this is what they can use to expand eligibility, Medicaid eligibility on Guam and cover more people. And so we've seen them do that when they, we change the eligibility. And th so this is to help them to continue to do that, to continue to get closer to universal health insurance coverage for all the people of Guam by expanding the eligibility of those who can be covered under Medicaid, making sure we have enough local matching funds to access all of the Medicaid money available for Guam. So that's the amendment it would be to allow that uh, use of unexpended appropriations. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Speaker Talahi. On the amendment, Senator Bloss, you're recognized. Point of uh, in inquiry. Um, public law 3599. I know 3654 is uh, FY 22. It, what is 30? What's 3599? Public law 3599. What is that? I'm not sure what you're referencing. I'm oh, I think you're on the next amendment. I'm on the next yeah, one. Okay. I'm not there. Yes, yeah, uh, that's why there was a little bit of confusion there. Okay. Uh, I believe uh, that's on the different amendment. Oh, because I thought I was following the right one. So on, just to be clear, we're on line three, page forty-one. SB 276. 93, page 41? Yes. Oh, 16. We can take a moment's recess to make sure uh, we've got the correct stuff in front of us. Real quick, one a moment's recess.
Okay, we're back from recess. So we've uh, clarified some issues with what section we're on. Um, anyone on this amendment proffered by Speaker Terlahi? Anyone on the amendment? If there's no one else, Speaker, uh, I'm sorry, Senator Nelson, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to rise in support of this amendment. Um, it is true that we don't really know the impact after December 2022 of this year. And um, there was some concern when we were discussing um, public health and the Medicaid match um, that their funding appropriation didn't account for this if we would lose this Medicaid matching rate of it's now 89%. And so uh, I support this amendment. I hope that uh, we'll be able to maintain this current match that we are in at 89% per, 80, at this time and then move forward in FY23. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Nelson. Anyone else on the amendment? Vice Speaker, you're recognized. Mr. Julius Mossy, Mr. Chair, I promise I'll be real fast. I just want to stand and rise in support of this amendment as it continues to, to support the efforts of services uh, for our community. So I support the efforts and thank the speaker for proffering it. Senator Mossi. Thank you, Vice Speaker Tina Munya Barnes. Uh, anyone else in the amendment? If there's no one else, Madam Speaker, you may close. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd just like to thank my colleagues for their support and standing in support of this. And, and uh, my colleagues have always been, I think we've always been as a legislature pretty united when it comes to Medicaid and expanding coverage for the people of Guam. So, Sitsu Asmasi. Thank you, Madam Speaker. On the amendment, are there any objections? Okay. Seeing none, motion carries. We are now on SB 276 TMT L3 P41. So that is line three, page 41. Uh, this is adding a new section, section 17. Madam Speaker, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair, again. So I'm adding a, another new section to this part, this chapter of the bill. This section is Environmental Health Fund Continuing Appropriation Authorization. This was specifically requested by the Division of Environmental Health at Department of Public Health. And this allows them to use the unexpended balance of funds appropriated to them in Public Law 3599, which, which was the FY21 budget, and Public Law 3654, which was the FY22 budget. So both of those carry over uh, for them to use. And they're specifically going to use these because they are in the middle of recruiting personnel. Now, they are in dire need of personnel. De Department of Environmental Health, just to re remind everyone, they're the ones that do the inspections, the food safety inspections. During COVID, they've been doing you know, the COVID safety inspections. Um, reviewing all the guidelines, the new guidelines under executive orders that, that we've had to um, implement and coming up with whole new you know, ways to operate uh, safely. So this is for their personnel. And um, uh, later on in the bill, they've also requested that we make a permanent change to this um, environmental health fund and make it a revolving fund. So I'm going to attempt to do that, but right now this is uh, just to make sure that they get those unexpended balances that they are counting on right now for recruitment pur purposes, in particular for this personnel that they are in the middle of recruiting, and you know how that takes a long time. They don't want to lose that in the middle. And, um, and also for operational expenses of the division, which this fund authorizes them to do. That's my amendment, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Speaker Talai. Anyone on the amendment? Senator Bloss, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I don't, I don't object to the bill. I mean, uh, to the to the amendment. However, I, I think that I, I need to uh, reiterate the concern and the issues that were brought up when we were talking in Chapter One with BBMR and uh, OFB about the continuing appropriations authorizations and whether or not there's, there's cash there. I'm a little concerned here about the utilization of, um, you know, the unappropriated fund or the unexpended balance for 35.99 in that those, those books are closed. 
and they might, it might not necessarily be there already. Um, again, I don't, I don't object to it. I'm, I just want to raise a point of concern with regard to the presentation by BVMR and OFB and also the concern as to whether or not there is the 3599 that that money still exists because the book's closed on it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Senator Bloss. Anyone else on the amendment? Senator Perez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I rise in support of this amendment. Um, recently, Department of uh, Environmental Health uh, held a uh, uh, meeting regarding this, uh, the need for recru rec recruitment and retention. And some of the information that they provided is that many of the staff, uh, they're overworked. Um, there's uh, basic limitations on upward mobility. Uh, there's also just a, a large workload when it comes to uh, inspections of restaurants and establishments. And um, in going through the budget cycles for the past years, we've also seen that um, DEH is underfunded, uh, primarily because it's the local funding is what supports this part of the, this division. And so I think it's important that um, if there's any leftover money, that they still have this opportunity to use as funds. Um, knowing, knowing them, uh, they have been hard at work, not only carrying out the day-to-day -day tasks, but they've also updated many of our regulations uh, regulations that have been, uh, you know, decades uh, in need of, of uh, updating. And so they're hard at work uh, to, for the people of Guam in making sure that, um, that we are safe, um, and, and including in, in response to the, co in, to the pandemic. So um, I, I rise in support of supporting this very much uh, overlooked division. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Perez. Vice Speaker, you're recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I must uh, rise in support of this amendment and ditto the uh, same sentiments as the, our previous speaker uh, because of the efforts of what we've done in the 35th Guam Legislature in the 30s and here in the 36th, I think it's important that we give them the resources it needs and environmental health, uh, it, um, um, Funding is truly needed, but more importantly, this division uh, has provided a lot, and I think it's really, really, really uh, important that we give them the resources and the personnel that it needs, uh, especially since they've been a part of the frontliners uh, as it relates to what their mission mandate is. So thank you, Mr. Chair. I, support, I will support this amendment. Senator Masi. Thank you, Vice Speaker Munya Barnes. Senator St. Augustine, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to echo what my colleague said earlier. The question of is if the money's there. Every year they close the books. Every agency is told, spend everything you can spend. Now, when we talk about recruitment in public health, or what, in whatever agency, if they were selected, if there are a warm body coming in, Understood. Cover them. But if it's, it's in hope that they can hire somebody, there's no money there. And exactly what my colleagues mentioned earlier. So I support what public health needs to do. There's no doubt. But I just don't want us to, to go down a road unexpended balances from prior year obligations, prior appropriations, shall be utilized for the recruitment of personnel for recruitment, for the hope that they find people to hire. I think the question should be is, do you have anybody to hire? Did you process that? Are they ready to be, have they gone through the drug, you know, gone through the process? They've been identified, then so be it. Continue resolution, continue appropriation, easy one. But if there's nobody, that's kind of rough. There's a hope, 35, public law 3599, my colleague mentioned earlier. Those books are closed. There's no money there. Uh, I, I don't believe there's money. There may be, but I don't believe there is. And if there is, then so be it. But uh, OFB, BBMR mentioned that. They don't recommend continuing appropriation because 
We always have to remember when budgets are created, it's you use what you have and you carry forward. It's not like leave it in the bank and do later. No, it's carry forward. And it's used to identify revenue base or whatever money is there. It's never used as a basis to say, let's draw from here. Because if we could, great. If the money does exist, then great. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just, I support public health. And what they do, they do a great job. They got great staff. But they're understaffed, no doubt. So I, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not technically going to object to it, but I've got reservations with this to say, use money from public law 3599 and it doesn't, and it doesn't happen. Then they're going to say that the legislature authorized to do this and then public, and then BBMR and DOS says, the books are closed, there's no money there. Who are we hiring? There's nobody to hire because there's no money. And I really hope they have a recruitment going on. If, if this passes, I really hope they have a recruitment going on. It's August, one more month before the fiscal year ends. And if they don't have anybody, then we just ask them to please recruit tomorrow because we already reserved that money that's not, not there or maybe there. Okay, I don't know. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator San Augustine. Anyone else on the amendment? Senator Tidegui, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, Mr. Chair, as I attended the public hearings for the budget, well, along with the chairman, one of the biggest concerns we had was the carryovers that were not utilized as we go into this budget to figure out how much money they use. Most every single agency, and I, I attended about 95% of those public hearings for the budget, I'd ask how much excess revenue do you have from FY21, FY2020, I mean, uh, FY20, FY21, how much is left in your lapses? You'd be shocked at some of them, their answers. Which was shocking was some of them said, we do have a lapse, but I don't know how much it is. You're coming to a budget hearing for your budget and you can't tell me how much money is left over from an FY21 budget or an FY2020 budget, which you said you have some lapses left over. I, I, I was just shocked. Then come to find out some of the agencies were able to answer the question, like the Attorney General's office. From FY21, they actually had $600,000 that they did not expend. So that, that's quite a bit of money. And I, I understand one of the, the biggest things that the OPA uh, mentioned, that the only way to really get your books in order is to close these accounts every year. And it's not just the agencies, but it's also bills that were passed in, uh, that were passed in the past <laughs> that became public law that have yet to be um, appropriated that funding, but it's been obligated already. So it becomes very difficult, you know, to try and close any books, but we got to start somewhere. We really need to start somewhere. So I'd, I'd just like to make a, a slight amendment that doesn't need to stop anything or if, if it's okay with this body. And just, um, if, if public health still has relapses from FY21, then they should utilize that first. Close their books. Then FY22 comes up, they can close. The, so I recommend Mr. Chair, to, to strike out Public Law 3654 and just allow them the lapses from 2021 as we're trying to, you know, become more financially sound and, and be able to locate where this funding is at. I think that would, that would be, you know, helpful in getting to where we, we need to be, and that is to be able to close our books every year and, and start fresh and not having, not having excess revenue and then never knowing what these agencies spend it on because there's no obligation to them to tell us what they use those lapses on. 
and how they spent it. So I just would like to make an uh, amendment, just just cross out Public Law 3654 and just Public Law uh, 3599 to stay in, in place for 21. Okay, there's a motion to uh, make an amendment by striking out Public Law 36-54, but I'm gonna take a recess and ask that uh, we have that submitted in writing just to make sure it's clear. Oh, no, no, no. No need for writing, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I'm just ask the body if they can just, yeah. I'm good. I'm good. I Let's just take a real quick <laughs> recess.
Okay, we are back from recess. The amendment has been loaded to the drives and uh, the hard copies will be passed out, but I think it's a simple amendment so we can proceed without the hard copies. We know what it is. It's loaded to the drive um, for tracking purposes to make it uh, cleaner for the clerks when they're doing their work. Uh, okay. Senator Tidegui, your motion, uh, you've already made just the motion. Just to make an amendment, yeah. Just to, uh, an Go amendment. Ahead. That amendment, Mr. Chair, is just to strike out public law 36 dash. 55, yeah, dash 55. Four. Um, and and that's it. I, I think I did my okay. explanations and uh, earlier on that we're trying to be more frugal and uh, account for the funding that is being spent. You know, a lot of times we don't know when the lapses come that are used what it's spent on. So let's try and get to where we, we should be with the OPA mentioned as well as BBMR mentioning, trying to keep our books in order. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Tidegui. On the amendment to the amendment proposed by Senator Tidegui, is there anyone on the amendment to the amendment? Oh. Speaker. Objection, Mr. Chair. Yes, I object to that amendment because it's striking out the funding source of Public Law 3654, which would be the FY 2022 lapses. That's exactly what this Division of Environmental Health presented to us. And they gave us full explanations as to why they want lapses. Otherwise, OFB could have given them the additional money. But um, at this point, there's no harm in giving them public law 3599, FY21 lapses. If there's nothing there, there's nothing there. No harm. If there's, they've proposed to us that for FY22, they're expecting lapses of 300, and they put this all in writing, $350,000, primarily from personnel of the Environmental Health Fund. And this is a sp special fund. And although recruitment packages were timely submitted, certification lists for recruitment did not occur until April 2022. The certification lists come from DOA, not from public health. So they waited for those. They got that. And they are moving diligently to do this hiring. So they're requesting that the lapses come with no restrictions except for its intended purpose, which is for access and use by Division of Environmental Health. And again, they've, they've outlined to us how the salaries for these positions are so low, but they have the exact same requirements as other local and federal employers who pay much higher. So that's one, been one of the challenges for their recruitment. So, and they budgeted this to hire, right? And um, so I just don't want to impede that hiring. Otherwise, we perpetuate this cycle over and over every year. They can't complete the hiring. And they're, they are in dire need of hiring. They've been so diligent. They've called meetings. And they've presented to us budget documents. So it's not like they're sitting around not trying to get their work done and not trying to get the hiring done. I think they've been very diligent. And they've been working through this COVID short-staffed and so let's just give it to them while they need it let's get them caught up and if they can use lapses to catch up it's not like we're going through the budget and and in every agency giving them lapses i'm not doing that this was done for the cancer trust fund earlier today no objection none and i'm only doing it for this environmental health fund because they're in the middle of their recruitment and I just did it for the, the one right before this. But these are the, the Medicaid and I explained why that's dire as well. So in the absence of them being funded, these additional amounts, they've been funded status quo. So we are just giving them their lapses and they are going to make use of those and be very diligent about it. So I object to that amendment to take out the funding source that they cite that they need. The FY22 lapses of 350 that they, they budgeted to recruit and, and receive the recruitment list in April 2022. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Speaker Talahi. Uh, anyone else on the amendment to the amendment? Senator Ada, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just for a point of information that on the Guam Cancer Trust Fund that 
an amendment to the amendment was made and that the, um, the, the, the lapses would go in, but it would be, it shall be expended at the end of FY 2023. So just for your information that that's what we've done, that the lapses, everything should be uh, expended by the end of 2023. So there'll be no longer any carryovers. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Adda. Anyone else on uh, the amendment? To the amendment. If there's no one else, Senator Tidy, will you may close? Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, for my colleagues, I wanted to find out why OFB uh, did not fund them uh, on, on the request. I mean, I, I understand the speaker uh, would like to see this money being used for this re these recruitments. I'm, I'm sure when this budget was put together, um, if the intent was there to, to help out public health, they would have done it. But I was told that they're not spending the money. They're just not spending the funds. And that's why it was not appropriated, uh, appropriated to, the, to this department, because of that. So, um, you know, I, and, and I appreciate uh, my good colleague uh, from Sinahanya also mentioning about the Cancer Care Fund. I mean, it's already bad enough that they don't get the right amount that's supposed to be given to them at a certain percentage, um, but that money is spent right away. It's not, usually there is no lapses by, you know, the half, half of the year has already gone by. They spent most of it, and then just a little lingering at the end. But um, so I, I, I asked my colleagues to, to support this amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Tidegui. On the amendment to the amendment, there has been an objection. So all those in favor of the amendment to the amend amendment, please signify by raising your hands. Motion fails. We are on the main amendment. Anyone else on the main amendment proffered by Speaker Terlahi? If there's no one else, Speaker Terlahi, you may close. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, the amendment will restrict them um, for using it for the recruitment of personnel and expenses of this Division of Environmental Health. The money is coming out of a special fund, not the general fund, it's the Environmental Health Fund. And so this money has been set aside already in this Environmental Health Fund for these purposes. They budgeted and tried to recruit people and are hopefully going to be able to complete that. But as we know, they have to comply with the Department of Administration and their hiring, as, you know, that's where their hiring goes through. So I would just, again, ask my colleagues to please allow this division to complete this hiring, hopefully catch up, and hopefully we don't have to see this again in the next fiscal year. But for this one, a purpose and because that they have presented to us why they have had difficulty in recruitment, even as in establishing qualified people, competing with others, so getting people to apply over here, and now that they've got a list, they want to complete that hiring. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Speaker Talahi. On the amendment, are there any objections? If there are no objections, motion carries. We are now on amendment SB276TMTL3P41. Again, this is line three, page 41. I think we just did that one, Mr. Chair. I apologize. I had two copies of the same amendment. Uh, let's move on to the Next amendment, the proper amendment should be SB 276 TMT L26 P42 through 43. So again, that's line 26, page 42 to 43. Speaker Talahi, you are recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. So now, just for my colleagues, we are now on the behavioral health section of the bill. And we've moved on from the Department of Public Health, we're on Guam Behavioral Health and Wellness Center. This would amend section two of part three, chapter three, which is the detoxification and rehabilitation services section, section two of the Guam Behavioral Health and Wellness. 
So section two of the bill. Mr. Chair, so is that the, the proper amendment then is Yes, the let me clarify. Line 26, page 42. Yes, uh, let me clarify one more time. So it is, it is the correct amendment is SB 276 TMT L14 P42. So this is line 14, page 42. And it should say uh, to amend section two of part three, chapter three. Okay, Speaker Chalahi, you're recognized. Great, thank you, Mr. Chair. And so I do have uh, two amendments for Guam Behavioral Health. And the first, they're both to increase appropriations to the to detoxification programs. The first one is section two. It, it's going to increase the appropriation to this detoxification and rehabilitation service by the amount of 342,774. And if we increase it by that amount, that would bring it up to Guam Behavioral Health's requested amount for these detoxification services. And they testified that if they do not get the full amounts that they've requested, they're going to have to cut current um, services. And again, these are detox, rehab services. I don't think I need to stress for my colleagues the importance of these types of services in, you know, if we can't stop the drugs at the border, we have a crisis on our hands and we need to help these families, help these individuals, and continue to provide services while we shore up our borders and, and stop the drugs from coming in. In the meantime, we need to give them these services. Crucial. So that's all it does. It funds this $342,000 from the 2% general fund reserve in section 2I of chapter 1, or chapter 1, public 30, Public Law 3654, the Rainy Day Fund. Again, the FY22 Rainy Day Fund, 2% set aside. And, um, and so this is just to increase the appropriation in the bill by this amount from this funding source. Again, this is um, alcohol and drug detox, rehabilitation, prevention services, to help with crime issues and to help with our families uh, and in their need. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Speaker Talahi. Uh, Vice Speaker, you're recognized. Mr. Chair, uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. And, and uh, as I want to stand and rise in support of this measure, I think it's really important that we just double check because if I'm not mistaken, this amendment may be in chapter 13, part two, section 11, one, and if we can just check with legal or whatever to make sure that we're not duplicating it, because I support this effort, as I said earlier this morning, the resources are really needed there, but I wanna make sure that we're not double appro appropriating. So if we can just please double check, a moment's sure. recess, please. We'll take a moment's recess to check with the clerk.
Okay, we're back from recess. Uh, Vice Mr. Speaker Munya Barnes, you're recognized. Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, with all due respect, I, I, like I said earlier, I support the amendment and its efforts, and I just wanted to make sure that it wasn't double appropriated, and I don't know, something to the effect that if a uh, motion to to work with legal counsel, if, if there's any duplication or redundancy as it relates to the amendments, then that, that the legal can, legal can uh, make the necessary corrections if necessary. I, but uh, I do support the amendment. Okay, there's a motion to make uh, technical amendments in case there's any sort of duplication. Anyone on that motion? Uh, I'm sorry, uh, any objections to the motion? Seeing none, motion carries. We're back on the uh, amendment. Uh, Senator Blas, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I think an amendment, if you read the word, the, the verbiage, and you look at the, the numbers, they don't match. It says, three, the wording says 342,774. And the wording says 342,774. So I don't want to make them. Can we just make the, make the technical? Okay. Okay, so can you make that uh, motion to go Mo with the. Motion to ask to legal make counsel a to make sure amendment that the, to go with the words, the yeah. verbiage matches the, um, the number, which is. And it's 342,774. Okay, on that motion, are there any objections? Seeing none, motion carries. Still. Senator Bloss, you're still recognized. Thank you. And, and, you know, one more again. I don't, st I don't want to stand in objection to this. However, I, you know, I recognize this, that this is probably better served and, and a better placement if you put this in the miscellaneous section. That way it doesn't really, it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't interfere with the bottom line with regards to the, the numbers as, as provided in, in chapter one. Um, it's, it's just gonna become an accounting nightmare. Again, I don't wanna, it's not that I'm, I'm opposing the intent, is this, this is not the right place for it. It should be in the miscellaneous section. Okay, so I just want to register that concern and leave it up to the body. I don't know. I can, let me talk to the point of order. Let me talk to the chair. Point of order. Uh, speaker, you're recognized. There is nothing wrong with the placement of this amendment. The section is an appropriation section. It's got nothing to do with revenues. We are appropriating here. It's in the bill already. The appropriation. This just adds on an additional appropriation from a fund not cited in any revenue provisions. It, it's irrelevant, honestly, and... There was no motion. Yeah, no motion has been made. No motion. Uh, so just to clarify, it was just yeah. an issue that he was raising and that uh, Senator Bloss wanted to uh, discuss with Senator St. Augustine. It's, on. it's discussed, don't worry, just move on. So no on, motion. on the amendment, Senator Bloss, do you have anything else on the, on the amendment? Anyone else on the amendment? If there's no one else, Speaker Terlahi, you may close. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, we are just increasing the funding to Guam Behavioral Health for detoxification and rehabilitation services to the amount that they requested. In order to do this, we are taking 342000 that's all, out of the I think $42 million we're anticipating to be in the rainy day fund at the end of fiscal year 2023. So that's it. And uh, I hope my colleagues will support this. I hope I don't need to go on and on about the importance of this detoxification program, the good work that they are doing up there at the Guam Behavioral Health. It's one of our success programs. And the more we can give them, the more access to these programs our community is going to have. These are critical services critical services. So I thank my colleagues for their support and I ask all of them to please support this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Speaker Talahi. On the amendment, are there any objections? Seeing none, motion carries.
Wait, one more. We are now on the last amendment yes. in this chapter. So the last amendment of this chapter is SB 276 TMT L26 P42 through 43. That's line 26, page 42 to 43. Speaker Terlahi, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to my colleagues for their patience. So this is my final amendment on this uh, chapter. The, so again, it's Guam Behavioral Health and Wellness. I want to increase the inpatient detoxification program run at the Guam Behavioral Health by $101,000, 101,157 to be exact. That's all, because that would bring their appropriation total up to the amount that they requested. And I want them, when they commit that they, if they get these kind, this amount, that they are going to provide these services, then I want to give them that amount, because again, these are critical inpatient detoxification programs. And um, I am sure that every single one of us has experience with family and friends who are in dire need of these types of services. We have them on Guam. I'm so glad and sad that we need them, but very glad that we have them and that we've got some competence in these, in these programs. And I, I don't want to roll back the momentum that they have created, I want to expand that. So this would just bring them up to, again, to their requested levels. 101 out of, 101, 157 out of the 2% general fund reserve, that rainy day fund again. Thank you, Mr. Chair and colleagues, please. Thank you, Speaker Tulai. Senator Torres. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I rise in full support of this amendment, and I thank the proffer of the amendment for providing not only this fund for the inpatient detoxification, but also for the detoxification program. One thing that uh, I learned when I was contemplating these amendments is that this, these additional funds are going to fund specifically the, um, the addiction of meth and the treatment of meth addicts, which is a, a very different type of um, treatment detoxification treatment from, say, alcohol or um, heroin. And it's important to not only fund the, the program overall, but the inpatient program. And what I understand also is th the dire need to fund them is a result of, of them not having uh, prior grants available in the upcoming fiscal year. So this fills a critical gap, and it allows them to expand their meth detoxification program. And if there's any other uh, more important way or more uh, relevant way to spend reserve money, it would be on something like this because, as the, the uh, proffer of the amendment said, we are in a critical state on Guam and we must address it now. So, you know, Sidzus Maasi to all the people that work towards this effort, but uh, I'm, I'm very proud and honored to to facilitate in any way as part of this body towards the success of that meth detoxification program. So Sidus Maasi and you have my support. Thank you, Senator Torres. Vice Speaker Munya Barnes, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As noted by the retiring speaker, I just want to say that I too rise in support uh, of this amendment. It is a very critical amendment. It is a very needed, a much needed amendment and it is uh, our way as an August body to show the people of Guam that we really do care and we know that this pandemic is not easy. This, 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 this disease is what I would call it and that, that our people need help and, and this funding will go a long way in helping those efforts. And I thank the, the, the folks who run this program uh, for all that they do to help our uh, residents. So, Thank you to uh, the speaker who proffered this amendment, and I re rise in support. Sina Masi. Thank you, Vice Speaker. Anyone else on the amendment? Senator Moylan, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for the, uh, also to the author of the sponsoring this amendment. Yes, uh, this will be very helpful. Uh, with my prior experience at the Department of Corrections and the parole office, we constantly see the recidivism that happens um, with prior inmates uh, breaking their parole by they violating their parole by uh, continuing to use drugs and uh, the funding for this is, is important especially I would say coming out of the rainy day fund because we got an epidemic of drugs on the island 
It's raining drugs on the island, basically, and it's because we, we need more support for our customs, but in the meantime, how do we treat our, our residents, our, those with this habit, illegal habit as well? You know, we, we look at the island, I do, as a high-intensity drug trafficking area. Uh, and in the, until we fix this, at least we're able to treat this, and hopefully we can prevent them from getting back into those same bad habits. So I'm, I'm very supportive of this measure, just like the last one as well, to support our, uh, our, um, the, for their rehabilitation. Uh, and eventually we can probably get on to other things where we can further support our Guam customs so we can work hand in hand by trying to stop these drugs from coming into the island. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Moylan. Anyone else on the amendment? Senator Nelson, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I rise in support of this amendment. Um, this is becoming a, a concerning issue for us, especially with the addiction towards uh, methamphetamines. And uh, we see it very, uh, all too often in our community, and we also see how it impacts the family of those that are addicted to this type of drug, or any drug for that matter. I believe that this is a great investment to help those families and to help the individuals uh, recover from their addiction and to support them because as a community we were raised and taught that we are there to help one another build each other up and to take care of each other so I thank the sponsor for this amendment and for her due diligence ensuring that this appropriation was right-sized thank you senator Nelson anyone else on the amendment if there's no one else speaker oh, I'm sorry <clears throat> senator Perez you're recognized I rise in full support of this amendment. Um, I think I would like to actually amend it by increasing it to 201,000, so adding 100,000 more to this. Um, I think it's really critical that we put more funding into uh, re you know, rehabil rehabilitation of um, those that have been impacted by this epidemic. No objection. There is a motion to amend the figure to, I'm sorry, Senator Paris, can you repeat the amendment? Yes, it's adding $100,000 more, so it's 201,157. Okay, there is a motion to amend to 201,157. Are there any objections to the motion? No objection. Seeing none, motion carries. On the main motion or the main uh, amendment, if there's no one else, Speaker Talahi, you may close. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and again, my colleagues, awesome. All together, I think we are, again, this is one thing that we've always been able to unite on. It's something we have to put all our efforts towards, and that is stopping the drugs from coming in and helping those families who are suffering from meth addictions, other addictions, and the fact that we can provide services I say, let's give them all the money we can find. And um, so they will be able to use these amounts. And if they come and tell us they can use more, I say, let's give them more. I'm, I'm optimistic because the, the settlement money from the opioid uh, settlement that the Attorney General's entered into also proposes to give money towards these types of programs. So, you know, hopefully, again, we can stop the drugs at the border and and continue to provide these services and, and hopefully we, we, will, we will do what we set out and that is to, to stop this addiction, meth addiction from spreading, stop the crime associated, associated with meth addiction as well and other addictions. It's just Masi, Mr. Chair, and to my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker Talahi. On the amendment, are there any objections? Seeing none, motion carries.
Okay, we have completed chapter three, the health chapter. We've completed chapter three, and uh, we will continue with chapter four, but we will recess first. Chapter four is unified judiciary. We will recess until tomorrow at 10 a.m. and begin with chapter four.